you can turn to Acts chapter 11. That's where we'll be at. And um, uh, it's been a while since we've been in the book of Acts, so I'm just going to put together a few uh, slides here to kind of refresh our minds, all right, with what's been going on. And um, uh, might, uh, as we go through Acts, uh, might uh, do a little bit with uh, as far as uh, the geography of it, all right? It's very interesting as you uh, see events unfolding in the book of Acts to see how where the Lord was working and how God was using people from different places and what was going on. So I um, won't keep this up the whole time, but just uh, to get us started off here, all right? Let's, but let's look at uh, the scriptures first, uh, Acts 11, and uh, let's begin reading in uh, verse 19. And uh, just to uh, catch us up here with, with chapter 11, uh, the first half, Peter is rehearsing to the church of Jerusalem about Cornelius being saved. Now, Cornelius, remember, he was a, uh, a leader of the Roman army. Uh, he had, uh, I forget how many soldiers it was, uh, un under his uh, command. But then uh, God began working in his heart, and God <coughs> brought Peter to Cornelius and, uh, there in Caesarea. And when Peter got back to Jerusalem, the church wanted to know, what were you doing eating with Gentiles and with Grecians? And, uh, and so he had to rehearse those things. And uh, we see that they, uh, let's see, let's, let's go ahead and read uh, verse 18, all right? It says, when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, then uh, hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. And there was kind of a mixed multitude there at the church of Jerusalem. Some of those staunch Jews, uh, where it says they held their peace, it means they decided to hold their tongue. It didn't mean they were satisfied and they, they were happy about it, but they're just kind of like, well, great, now God's used the Gentiles. <laughs> uh, but they didn't like the idea that uh, the Spirit of God and salvation through Christ was available outside of uh, the Jewish nation. That it was something uh, for all nations. And that's what we're going to see here, all right? Uh, but there was those then also within the church, they uh, glorified God. And we see that there in the other part of the verse, all right? So now we'll start reading to verse 19, and we're going to read uh, down to about verse 26, all right? It says, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, <clears throat> preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the, unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came into the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man, and full of the Holy Ghost, and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Parsis for to seek Saul. When he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church, and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Mm. So here we see uh, the church is beginning to branch out. All right, and um, I tell you, we'll, we'll go ahead and go through these slides, and then we'll have a word of prayer. All right, but uh, back in Acts chapter eight, uh, we saw Philip, and he was the first person uh, recorded in the scriptures to begin reaching non-Jewish people. Now they were half Jews; they were the Samaritans. All right, and um, he, uh, upon the the persecution there of Stephen, uh, he goes into Samaria. And then God calls him away, and that's why the line's kind of dotted there. He's in the middle of a revival, and God literally just picks him up and puts him on the road uh, to Ethiopia. And there's an Ethiopian eunuch. And there he witnesses to him, and he is uh, uh, witnessing this man. He gets saved and baptized there on the side of the road, and goes back and takes the gospel into northern Africa. Amen. Uh, and then it says that uh, as soon as uh, the baptism is done, he was called away and he was found uh, again in Samaria and preached as far as Caesarea. Now we'll see later on, actually, he uh, stayed in Caesarea and uh, actually established a family there. All right. But that's the ministry of, of uh, Philip. And we see that uh, in Acts 8 there. Now, this is going to work. Yeah, it may not work. I might have to come down there and do it. All right. Let's come down here real quick and do it this way. <laughs> Oh, now I went too far. 
Okay, there. All right, now, uh, in the same area, okay, so next chapter, <coughs> 9, we have Saul. Now, we know the conversion of Saul, all right? Uh, and uh, probably familiar with that. He hears the Lord himself on the road to Damascus. Uh, he's going to Damascus uh, up in the north, and he's going up there to persecute Christians. Mm -hmm. And he hears the Lord call out, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He comes back then to Jerusalem, and we just read about Barnabas. Barnabas actually brings Bar Saul back to Jerusalem, and they encourage the church to uh, take Saul under their, their wing, so to speak. And uh, he was a persecutor of the church. They didn't trust him. They thought it was a trick. And Barnabas says, no, no, he's genuinely been saved. And we need to disciple this man. Uh, God's changed his life. And he saw the Lord on the road to Damascus. And so uh, they were there for a time. But then the Jews that were not saved in Jerusalem, uh, they'd lost their greatest, uh, their star, so to speak, uh, their greatest uh, advocate against this Christianity. And so they rose up to kill Saul. And so then Saul is taken from Jerusalem uh, to Caesarea. And even on the way to Caesarea, we see this in Acts 9, he's witnessing the Gentiles. In fact, uh, we'll, we'll look at a verse here in a little while. But uh, God told Saul, as, when he got saved on the road to Damascus, I've saved you to be a light to the Gentiles. And so he knew that that was his destiny. When he got saved, he also received a calling. And so God was going to use him to share the gospel with Gentiles. Uh, but not yet. All right? Not yet. So he goes to Caesarea, and eventually he then takes a ship back to Tarsus. All right? And so that happens in Acts 9. Uh, then we see, uh, let's see, Acts 10. Uh, I just I went too fast there, didn't I? Peter's journey is in Acts chapter 10. And that we, uh, I just mentioned how he went to Cornelius' house. And then when he comes back, uh, the first half of chapter 11, he reports that to the church. And so over and over, God was making it clear uh, that he wanted to reach people outside the Jewish people. Outside the Jewish community, all right? They're going into Samaria, Caesarea. They're reaching Gentiles, all right? But um, the church of Jerusalem didn't get the picture. Uh, it was clear that God wanted all nations to hear the gospel. But the believers in Jerusalem had a hard time obeying that command. So God was going to choose to use believers from other places to expand the gospel. And so we just read some of these places here in, uh, in the scriptures. Uh, Cyrene was mentioned, Cyprus, and um, there's Antioch, all right? And so we're going to learn about Antioch. So uh, that's about 300 miles. Uh, I've got it in my notes, 400 some case, all right? Uh, uh, that is. And so, um, you know, there's a little distance there, but God is expanding the reach of the gospel, all right? And then Tarsus is where uh, Saul was originally from. And when the persecution against him personally uh, began in Jerusalem, uh, he was taken back to Tarsus. And he's been there now for, for some time. But uh, we see Barnabas is now going to seek out Saul and bring him to Antioch. All right. So uh, just to give you a, a visual picture of what's happening and where it's taking place at. All right. And uh, that's why I want to do that. And um, so we'll uh, let's see, I'll move this. And then we'll pray and slide into the message, all right? Okay. So let's pray and then we'll, we'll get into the, the scriptures. Lord, we thank you for this morning. And Lord, we thank you for, uh, Lord, you, your love for mankind. Lord, you're not willing that any should perish. Lord, there's no people group or uh, denomination or church that has an edge on the gospel. Uh, Lord, you want every individual, every soul to have the opportunity to be saved. And Lord, as uh, you were reaching out here in the early church, uh, Lord, I pray that we would look at their example and Lord, being like-minded. That Lord, we would be uh, men and women that are uh, filled with the Spirit of God and Lord, would go forth uh, sharing the good news of the gospel. Uh, Lord, I pray you speak to each one of us this morning. Uh, Lord, if there's one here that's not saved, I pray, Lord, you would show them that need. Lord, if there's one that's uh, here, we're saved, but not living in obedience, I pray, Lord, you would... Uh, show us that, and Lord, we would change. Lord, we would be in line with the Word of God, and Lord, be living uh, lives that are pleasing unto you. Mm -hmm. uh, Lord, fill my uh, fill my heart, my mind with your Spirit. Mm -hmm. You get honor and glory in everything that is said and done. We'll ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. So here in Acts 11, uh, we, we see there, there's some places and there's some people mentioned. Yeah, I. Uh, <clears throat> uh, 
I titled this a couple different titles, a couple different ways. I've been using uh, these as I go through the book of Acts for, for whatever reason. And here you can say this was the deputation of Barnabas. Uh, to deputize someone, I think of the old west, you know, they had your sheriff and he, and he needs a deputy. You know, so yeah, I'm going to deputize you. What does that mean? You're uh, delegating someone to take your place in your absence. And that's what they did here. The church of Jerusalem, uh, a little bit further down in the verses that we were reading, they sent forth Barnabas. They said, well, we can't all go to Antioch and see what's going on. Barnabas, you go up there and see what's going on. I wanna re- we want to know what this is all about. Uh, these Grecians that are saying that you know, they're, they're believing in Christ, and uh, uh, these people that have been sent, that they've gone out from Jerusalem now with, from the persecution, and they, they're saying these Grecians are receiving Christ. We want to know what's going on about that. I mean, and we can't all go up there. So you go on our behalf, Barnabas, and you go find out what's going on. So he was deputized, we would say, the deputation of Barnabas. But it's not just Barnabas mentioned here. There's several good men uh, that, that are called out here. And yet nothing is put in the scripture by accident. No. Uh, God is using each one of these individuals uh, to bring together the plan of evangelism. And eventually we're going to see that the church in Antioch will be the basis for missions, uh, the, the initial missions movement uh, of the church. And God is going to use these individuals to bring all that together. And he's going to put them in, in you know, where he wants them and then use them how he sees fit to bring all that together. All right. So there's several things we see here. Let's see. Uh, there's, let me find it in my notes. I'll give, give you my, my roadmap here, okay? Uh, we see a scattering of the people. We see their sowing that takes place. We see the sending uh, of Barnabas. Uh, we see the searching of Barnabas. And then we see a showing, a showing, all right? And so let's go back to verse 19 and just go uh, through it verse by verse. And it says then that they, were, they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that rose about Stephen. The first individual we see mentioned is Stephen. Now, Stephen, that took place back in the first half, first part of the book. And that, that would be, you know, several years removed from this, this point, all right? Uh, people differ, you know, how many, how many years passed, how, how long this has been going on. But it'd be at least a couple of years at, at the least, maybe more than that. And people would say, well, Stephen, we would assume he was a young man, all right? Now, I, I don't know how young he was, but... Uh, he was obviously uh, martyred. He gave his life. Um, he didn't live his life to the end of you know, his expectations, so to speak. And uh, he gave his life for the gospel, defending the Messiah, defending that Christ was the Messiah and now is the Redeemer of all mankind. And uh, the, the Jews there rose up and, and stoned him. What a, what a tragedy. And it was a tragedy. What, what a, a, a horrible way to die. What a horrible loss of a, a brilliant man. There he was, you know, and, and you, you look at um, Acts, and um, uh, Saul of Tarsus was one of those who was standing by and listening to his defense, listening to his arguments, and watch. And some believe maybe even was the one who told the men to pick up the stones and actually gave the order to stone Stephen. Mm. Wow. You know, that, that's, that's such a tragedy. And yet, the Holy Spirit has purposely mentioned that the persecution that arose about Stephen was the catalyst for the spread of the gospel mm-hmm. beyond Jerusalem. Right. Stephen's death was not an accident. And Stephen's death in the eyes of God was not a tragedy. It was a triumph. Amen. Because it, it created the, the movement to get the Jews in Jerusalem, the believing Jews, out of their comfort zone and get them moving with the gospel. Christ said from the, from the Mount of Olives as he ascended that you should be witnesses unto me. That you need to go into all the world. And you're going to preach to every nation, every tongue. And yet they wouldn't do it. And so God took one of their choicest men, one of their deacons, and said, I'm going to use him as his life and death as a catalyst to get you moving. Mm-hmm. Stephen didn't die in vain. Amen. Stephen died a triumphant victory. In fact, even if we look back, we won't take the time to, but it's one of the few places we see that even the Lord Jesus himself stood to welcome Stephen into heaven. He stood from his throne. 
and welcome him in. Uh, what, what a triumph, amen? And so we see Stephen. Stephen's one of these good men, amen? Uh, you know, we, we hear the phrase often, God's looking for a few good men. Well, God is looking for a few good men. And one of those good men was Stephen. We need men like Stephen. We need men who will stand up for the faith. We need men who are willing to die for the faith. Mm. You say, Pastor, do you think we're coming at a point where that, that's where we're going to be caught? I don't believe so. I don't see, you know, I don't see anything in the pipeline, all right? But we need to be willing to do that if we were called upon. Amen. We need to be willing to stand for the gospel. And as a result of that stand, then they were scattered. So there's a scattering that took place here. And we see Stephen being used for that. Now, the second thing we see then. Not only a scattering, but we see a sowing involved. There was sowing. So uh, as they went about, it says uh, they traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but the Jews only. So these were men of, it lists where they were, and they were on the map there, Cyprus, uh, Phoenice. Phoenice is the old Phoenicia. It's that, that area of the coastline from Caesarea all the way up to Tyre and Sidon. Uh, if you... you I didn't point those places out, but it's the coastline of, of Israel, all right? And so uh, there in, in that, that stretch there, all right? And uh, it says, as far as Antioch, so it went all the way up from uh, where Philip was in Caesarea and where um, uh, Peter had preached to Cornelius, all the way up to Antioch. They're, they're evangelizing that coastline, uh, that 300-mile stretch, 400K stretch. And, um, uh, they're, but it says they're preaching only under the Jews. So this sowing, first of all, there, there's two different kinds of sowing here. Uh, this one is prejudiced. And it's interesting that the word preaching in our, our English Bible here is actually two different Greek words. Um, the, the first one that we just read there in verse 19, uh, the word preaching the, uh, preaching the word, is not the same word that we think of when we think of preaching today. Uh, and we'll see the other word here in just a moment. But this is more of a dialogue. They were talking. They would discuss it. Yeah, uh, and, and they were only discussing it with the Jews. So, oh, you've come from Jerusalem. Yeah. Have you believed in the Christ? Yeah, yeah. And, and boy, it's got bad down there. Yes, it has. And uh, we, we, we had to come north because it's just, you know, uh, everything after Stephen, they just, you know, they're, they're finding us and they're, they're, they're taking my children. They were taking, they took my husband. Uh, I lost my job. You know, and, and then they're sharing their testimony, and that's good. That's good. But it's not the bold witness. It, 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 and again, they're only sharing this with other Jews. They're not sharing this with the Christians. Now, can God use a, uh, you know, a uh, <coughs> melancholy testimony? Yes, He can. All right, some, you know, uh, th th there's a time and place for that. All right, but notice the second uh, testimony, the second type of sowing. All right, verse twenty. It says, some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. Now, this group, uh, they're, they're from a different location, uh, some of them. And it mentions Cyrene. Cyrene was a city in northern Africa and uh, had a large Jewish population. Uh, it's uh, kind of near where uh, Benghazi is today. It's about 100 I think 100 kilometers removed from that or so. Um, the, the actual city, the ancient city is no longer there. All right? But Benghazi is the closest city, modern city, to where this would have been. But in, in this time period, the early church, it was a huge city. Um, and so uh, there was a large Jewish population there. And many of them had come uh, for Passover and everything in Jerusalem when Christ was crucified and, and had been resurrected. And they had witnessed all those events. They were there at Pentecost. In fact, if you look back in Acts 2, and there were men from Cyrene there at Pentecost. They heard uh, the, the gospel in their own language through the, the gift of tongues on the day of Pentecost. And so now they're carrying out the message. They're sharing the gospel. And they've come so far to Antioch. And it says they're preaching the word. Now this preaching, uh, uh, preaching the Lord Jesus in verse 20, this is the, the term uh, that we normally think of when we think of preaching today. This is the word that we get, our English word, evangelize. To proclaim, uh, to share the good news. And so they're not just talking dialogue with, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, they're actually standing up, and what I'm doing this morning, they are proclaiming the message. That yes, uh, Christ came, He fulfilled all the prophecies. 
He healed people. He verified himself with miracles. Uh, he fulfilled the law. He was crucified. And then three days later, he rose again. And 50 days passed. Uh, on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit of God fell and uh, verified uh, His presence in the hearts of believers with signs and wonders and miracles. And today, He is at work. And he is willing to say, whosoever will, even the Grecians. Uh, they were proclaiming the message. They were preaching the Word. And, and notice here that there is a huge difference in the preaching of verse 19 and the preaching of... Uh, verse 20. You know, preaching, um, <clears throat> preaching is what God has given to the church uh, as a vehicle for seeing lives changed. Now, it's not just preaching anything, all right? You say, a pastor, so you just say it's always whatever the preacher says. No, he has to be preaching the word, okay? The word is what is blessed. But how the word is delivered is to be done through preaching. Uh, Paul said it's through the foolishness of preaching. Amen. Uh, and uh, he says, I'm ready, Romans 1.15, I'm ready to preach to you that are at Rome also. Uh, he was a preacher of the gospel. Amen. And over and over, God blesses preaching. Uh, we can look back to the book of Acts and how uh, God has blessed preaching. And God wants us to uh, <clears throat> hear the word of God through preaching. Not just to read it. Yes, we need to read it. Uh, and we need to, to hear it, but we need to hear preaching. Amen? Um, I don't have the privilege that you do to have the opportunity to come and hear preaching three times a week. I know. I, I have to go get it somewhere else. And you know what I do? Mm. Because even your pastor needs good preaching. Mm. Your pastor needs preaching too. And I often, I, I'll listen to the you know, services there from King or somewhere else, you know, and... Uh, uh, the, the, thankfully, these days, there's a good place to find good preaching on the Internet, you know. But, uh, hey, I need preaching. And so we all need preaching. Now, we need to get as much preaching as we can. I think That makes me think of my grandparents. When I was little and I'd go stay with them for the summer, they would take me to camp meetings, and they would, they would have preaching three times a day, five days a week, and then we'd take off and go to the next camp meeting. And almost the whole summer, I was with Grandpa and Grandma, we were in holiness camp meetings. And some of them, I'll tell you what, they can get fired up. I just don't. <laughs> <laughs> I heard some wild preaching on some varied subjects, all right? Um, wasn't always quite uh, in the text, all right? But uh, they really got fired up by it. <laughs> but hey, they were preaching, you know? And um, they believed in salvation, all right? So it wasn't like, you know, it was way off doctrine, all right? But they just had some... Had some standards that weren't quite the same, and uh, they could read into read into the text a few things that weren't there. All right, but it was preaching, and, and Grandpa and Grandma they were they were one all the preaching they could get. I mean, any camp meeting that was going on, we were going to be there, you know, and we we're going to be there all day, and uh, it was going to be preaching. Hey, that's good. We need to have a hunger for preaching. Amen. Uh, what does preaching do? Well, here we see in um, the scriptures that first of all, verse twenty one, the hand of the Lord was with them. The hand of the Lord is just a, a way of signifying that God was blessing them. The Spirit of God was uh, using that. They had the touch of the Spirit. Amen. Uh, preaching has the power of God. If you're not getting good preaching, you're missing out on, on a blessing. You say, Pastor, I'd like to hear some good preaching. Well, <laughs> you say, Pastor, we put up with your preaching. I'm talking about good preaching. Well, hey. The preaching, all right? The, I try to give you good preaching, all right? Let, let, let God do the work, all right? You know, let God uh, uh, take what little I have, all right, and use it, all right? But uh, the blessing is upon the preaching of the Word, amen? And we need to be under and need to listen to good preaching and, and get what God has for us because He blesses preaching. Notice that the next thing He says here, that uh, uh, verse 21, a great number of them believed and turned unto the Lord. You know, when we have good preaching in our churches, we're going to see people get saved. Good preaching sees people turn to the Lord. It will turn the heart of the sinners. That's what preaching is all about. It's to convince the sinner. It's to convict the saint. It's to see change in our lives. I hope you don't come on Sunday mornings just to be entertained by, by your pastor. I don't think you do. Now, sometimes I know I'm kind of funny. All right. I've got a funny way of saying things. All right. I understand that. 
you know, yesterday Amy was joking around that she, you know, she wanted to be the entertainment. And I said, well, you can't do that on Sundays because it's church. <laughs> and she even said that this morning. Well, I'm not here to be your entertainment either, okay? Uh, I'm here to be preaching the Word. Amen? <laughs> and why do we have preaching instead of just entertainment? There's all kinds of churches. They'll have a talk. They'll do a drama. They'll have a concert. That's entertaining. It's good fellowship. But it's not preaching. Amen? Uh, man, one thing Dr. Comfort drilled on us in, in Bible college. <coughs> preaching is king and music is queen. Amen. Hey, music is wonderful. Music is, is lovely. Uh, Brother Derek, we had a good time yesterday morning. Fellowship was some good godly music. Hey, music is wonderful, but it can't replace the preaching. Amen. Nothing takes the place of preaching God, of God's Word. Amen. Amen. Preaching is what will change our lives. Preaching will change our hearts. And it puts us in tune with God. Amen. So we see their hearts return to the Lord. And then the third thing we see, uh, verse 22 then, then tidings of these things came into the ears of the church was in Jerusalem. You know, when there's good preaching and it changes us, well, everyone's going to take note of it. Here, this, this group in Antioch, which I, I didn't give you a whole lot of, about the city of Antioch, it was quite a wicked place. Uh, Antioch was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. And it was close, uh, very close to this temple they had there in uh, um, uh, Apollo, all right, the, the temple of Apollo. All kind of immoral activities going on there, all right? And uh, we don't need to get into all that, but you can just, you can imagine, all right? And uh, it was a wicked place. And here God has called out these believers to go into that city and reach these people with the gospel, and it was working. Why was it working? Not because they were just talking about it, because they were preaching it. Because they were preaching the word of God. And that's what God was blessing, amen, the preaching of his word. And when God blesses the preaching and God begins to change hearts and, and, and save souls, people are going to find out about it. Mm -hmm. You know what? I, I, I enjoy the testimony. Some of you uh, and, and others that um, I, I've heard out in our community, they come and they, or they, they visit with us and they say, I come because you preach the word. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of churches we can go to this morning and get our ears tickled, mm -hmm. have a good time. You know, uh, you know, have a, a community meeting. All right, that's not, where, that's not what we come to church for. We come to hear the preaching. That's right. We want our hearts challenged mm -hmm. because we know we're not right with God. What does God say? I need to do different. I'm convicted that something's not right. What, what does God say that I need to change to be right with Him? Give me some preaching, Pastor. I need to be preached to. Amen. That, that's what we need is preaching. Amen. And that's what God blesses. And that's what the people in Jerusalem heard about. You know, this wasn't put on Facebook, all right? This wasn't a news broadcast, all right? They're over 400 kilometers away. And they're getting word that something's going on in Antioch with these non-Jews. They heard about the preaching and how it was changing lives. Amen? So preaching will bring tidings of salvation. So then verse, uh, let's see here, verse uh, 22 what did they decide to do about it? So they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. Now we, we've seen, uh, like I said, a, a few good men here. And I mentioned Stephen, how God used Stephen. He was a good man, I believe, because God used him to scatter the saints and to spread the word of God. Uh, we see these men of Cyrene and Cyprus and how God was using them in the preaching of God's word. And now we see another good man. In fact, he is so good, that's exactly how God describes him. Uh, look at verse 24 and uh, describing of Barnabas says he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. Uh, God, God described him specifically that way. Now, Brother Brian, he didn't know it, but he read Romans 5 this morning. I was going to uh, connect to that. You know, Paul said that for even for a good man, someone even scarcely to die. That's mm -hmm. right. In, in this day, what was Paul saying there? He says, for a religious man, some would, would never... Let's go back over there, all right? Uh, Romans chapter 5. Because what, what does he mean by that? Romans 5 and verse 7. It says, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. What does that, what does that mean there, a righteous man? He's speaking not of a man made righteous in the eyes of God, but a man who's righteous in his own eyes. A religious man. One that he thinks he's got it made. He's got, it, he's got things right with God and he's good. We would say a Pharisee, a hypocrite. 
And he's saying, people see right through that. And for a righteous man, no one's going to die for him because he doesn't need it. That's right. They all know he's a fake. They, they know he's not right with God. And you, but you can't tell him otherwise. I'm not going to die for him. Let him die and find out for himself he's not righteous. You know, uh, Scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. That's just speaking of moral uprightness, integrity. Someone that they know they're not perfect, but they're going to do their best. And here, that's exactly how God then describes Barnabas in Acts chapter 11. It's interesting that, of course, we know all this is an inspiration, but God used the events and, and circumstances. Paul's one writing Romans. Paul was the one that was discipled by Barnabas. Paul knew what a good man was. Amen. Because he was discipled by a good man. Yeah. He said, you know, I wouldn't die for a religious man. I used to be one. I know what a hypocrite I was. I know, I, I know how two-faced I was. I wouldn't die for me. I might die for somebody like Barnabas. Because he's a good man. I'll probably give my life for Barnabas. But verse 8, Romans 5, verse 8, he said, But God committed his love toward us. God loved me. I wasn't a Barnabas. I was more like a self-made righteous man. I was far worse than that. I was a sinner. Mm. I was on death row headed to hell. And yet God loved me and demonstrated his love toward me in sending his son to die for me. Amen. That's the love of God shed abroad. Amen. That's God loving us. And here, now back in Acts 11, Barnabas was a good man. He was, he was an upright man. He wasn't just a good man, though. It says he was full of the Holy Ghost and full of faith. You know, Barnabas, and, and uh, let's go back to Acts 4. I'll hold your place here in 11. Just turn back a few pages. Acts 4 is the first place we see Barnabas mentioned. He's mentioned throughout the book of Acts. A wonderful testimony and, and example. We'll see him often. But here we see him mentioned the first time. Here his name is Hoseis, uh, Acts 4.36. And Hoseis, uh, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite and of the country of Cyprus. So he was, he was a Levite. He was a Jew. But he was not originally from Jerusalem. His hometown was Cyprus, the island of Cyprus. Now, Cyprus was, was the island that was out on the map there. It's this island that, um, and we'll see it mentioned again in the book of Acts, but that was his hometown. That, that's where he's from. Well, some of these men that are preaching in Acts 11, they're from Cyprus. So the church of Jerusalem, they recognize, hey, Barnabas, they said that some of those guys preaching up there in Antioch, they're from Cyprus. You, you might even know some of those guys. But they're, they're kind of like, you know, like-minded, you know, uh, same hometown and stuff. Maybe you could relate to them a little bit better. Maybe uh, you have better understanding of what's going on, and you just check this thing out. And, and that's, I believe, one reason why they sent Barnabas. And, of course, all that was under the direction of the Lord, amen, uh, whether the church understood it or not. But they sent forth Barnabas, and he could relate to them. He was, we see his descent. He was from Cyprus. Uh, we see in verse 23 now, Acts 11, 23, he had discernment. Uh, <clears throat> see, when he came, he had seen the grace of God and was glad. You know, when he came, he recognized it. He said, this is not just some, uh, you know, uh, overexcitement. It's not just some Grecian trying to get on the bandwagon with, with what's going on in Jerusalem. This is genuine salvation. And he discerned what God was doing. And so he recognized that. He had discernment. Uh, we see the direction he gave them. Look at verse 23. He says, uh, He exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Here, when he says, they, uh, with purpose of heart, it's an interesting word. It means to set forth, to put on display, to be an exhibit. And this word is actually used uh, in other places. Uh, it's used in the, in the Gospels of the showbread that was used in the temple. And there, the priest would take in the showbread and set it before the Lord. And it was put on display. 
It would be there for one week, and then afterwards they, the priest would eat that. A uh, demonstration of, uh, uh, then, uh, I forget exactly what that did. I forget the illustration, how that was, why the Lord gave the illustration. Uh, I just read it last night, and I, I forget how that was connected. But it was there, it said, before the Lord, and it was put on display for one week. And so here, Barnabas, he's used that same word. He says, your faith needs to have purpose. You need to put it on display. Don't let it be a candle hit under a bushel. If you're genuinely saved, we need to see the fruit of it. Now, is he talking about work salvation? No, no. He's saying, but there needs to, you need to bear fruit. You need to bear fruit. You know, we've seen in Acts 8 how Simon the Magician met a profession of faith. Philip the Evangelist, that, I mean, he was wonderfully used of the Lord, uh, a mighty preacher, and yet Simon deceived Philip. Made him believe that he would genuinely converted and, and wanted to follow after the Lord. And what was it? He really just wanted the ability to do the miracles and the signs and wonders. And when Peter came to Caesarea and found out about Simon, he rebuked him. And, uh, and Simon was put in his place, uh, you know, by the Lord through, through the Apostle Peter. Mm -hmm. So that event had happened, and no doubt Barnabas knew about that. And so here he exhorts uh, these believers in Antioch. He says, don't be like Simon the magician. Have purpose of heart. If you're genuinely saved, set yourself before the Lord and let, let him see what he's done in, in your life, the change in your life, and let others see that as well. Mm -hmm. Have purpose of heart. You know, I've said it often. God didn't just save us just to take us to heaven. If he did, none of us would be here. He's saved us on purpose. For a purpose. Amen? Uh, and we've been just looking through the book of Romans how there's that one thing. At least one thing that he's enabled and he expects us to do. Amen? We need to live life on purpose. We have a purpose when we're uh, the children of God. And so here he endured them to have purpose. Not only to have purpose, but then he says that they would cleave unto the Lord. And cleave there means to abide. To persevere. And he says, uh, again, you need to live life on purpose and demonstrate that this is genuine and then pursue the Lord. Be diligent. And, and don't just let this be a fly-by-night decision, you know? Uh, how many times people, even in our day, uh, they respond to good preaching and maybe they, they genuinely get saved, but then they're never discipled. And they fall by the wayside. Hey, Barnabas, he's saying, don't be like that. Don't just make a decision because somebody else made a decision. Uh, don't just, you know, do what everybody's doing in the heat of the moment. No, you purpose in your heart and then you cleave unto the Lord. You persevere and you make this thing permanent. You let this thing be real. And that's exactly what every one of us needs to do. Amen? Of course, many of us have done that. We've been saved for years. And praise the Lord. But hey, we need to make this thing stick. Amen? And by the grace of God, we will stick. Amen? It's not just us, amen? It's Christ that work within you. I hope of glory, amen? But here he's exhorting these young believers that they would persevere in their young faith. Again, we've already looked at verse 24. Uh, why did he do all that? Because he was a good man. He was full of the Holy Ghost and full of faith. We see the results of it then. Much people was added unto the Lord. You know, when you have a good man, and he just gives himself over to God, he's full of the Holy Ghost, and he believes God to do great things, you're just going to see results. You're going to see people get saved. That's exactly what happened. As, as Barnabas come to Antioch and he recognized this isn't just something that, you know, people make it up. This isn't just some uh, flighty thing that these Grecians are trying to get on board with whatever the Jews are doing down in Jerusalem. That this is real and God's really blessing this thing. He just encouraged it. <laughs> he just fanned that flame. And man, fanned, fanned the fire a little bit. And more people continue to get saved. God continued to bless what's going on in Antioch. Barnabas was a good man. So then we see the next thing here, the, the fourth thing, we see the seeking. The seeking. Barnabas would, went forth seeking. So then verse 25, then Barnabas was parted to uh, Tarsus for to seek Saul. Now, uh, we won't for time's sake take the time, but we can look in Acts 9 and uh, Acts 9 uh, I wrote the verse down. I'll just turn, it's just, just a page or two over. Just turn over there real quick. Um, verse 9, chapter 9, verse 15. Here, uh, uh, 
the Lord is speaking to Ananias about Saul. And the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. That's what the Lord told Ananias, and, and no doubt they told, told Saul moments after he got saved. So Saul got saved and immediately knew that God was going to use him to be a witness to the Gentile nations. He, he knew exactly what the will of God was almost immediately when he got saved. It doesn't happen like that for most people, all right? didn't happen that way for me, but that's what it did for Saul. And when he got saved, then he, he began witnessing to the Gentiles. And a part of the reason that there was such an uprising in Jerusalem when he got back down to Jerusalem. But God's had him wait. And, and you know, uh, there's, there's a principle there. That you not be a novice, all right? Uh, there's how approving in Saul's life. And God was preparing him. But that time was over. Now it was the time to put it into practice. It was time to be used of the Lord. And Barnabas recognized that if Gentiles were getting saved, but there was a man who was called to reach Gentiles, and he needed, he needed to be in on what God was doing. And so Tarsus was not that far away from Antioch. It was just around the coastline, basically. All right. And so he goes now to Tarsus, and it says, for to seek Saul. Uh, it's interesting, that phrase there, for to seek Saul. It's the same wording that was used when Mary and Joseph went back to find Jesus at the temple. They were looking diligently. And, and, and looking, you know, what, what, did we leave him here? Did we leave him there? And a three days journey and find him all the way back to the temple. And, and they're the seeking him out wherever he is in that huge crowd at the temple. And of course they eventually find him. But that's the way that Barnabas was seeking after Saul. Where is he? Where, where, what's happened to Saul? Uh, I know this is where he was from. Uh, many believe that when Saul got back to Tarsus, he was probably disowned by his family. He probably lost everything he'd ever had. He probably wasn't at the same address where he used to live. Probably another side of town by now. Where is Saul? Barnabas went for to seek him. You know, when we see God doing something, we need to link up with somebody. When we, when we see that somebody uh, <clears throat> could be used to do something, we need to encourage him. Step on board and do that. You know, we've talked about spiritual gifts now for the past month or two. And it may be that we see something needs to be done. But we're not able to do it. But we know someone so can do that. Nothing wrong with encouraging a brother or sister. Hey, you're, you're, you're gifted at that. You could, you could take care of that. Yeah, we had some of that in AGM. He said, well, hey, you could, you could serve in that way. I recommend so-and-so do that. What is that? Seeking out. We're seeking out those who can be used of God. Amen. And let them be a blessing to the church. Hey, we need to be seeking out those who can help us. We, when we need help, you know what? Barnabas recognized... <laughs> What God's doing here, I can't. I, I can't help all these people. I'm not going to disciple one Saul of Tarsus, but I can't disciple hundreds. We're going to need help here. But Saul of Tarsus, he was chosen to reach the Gentiles. He can help me with this. i got to go find Saul. And so he goes forth seeking. Amen. He goes forth to seek Saul. The last thing we see here then, the end of verse 26, it says the disciples were called Christians first. At Antioch. The, word, the title of Christian, of course, today, Christianity and, and being a Christian, that's a title and a term that is used so pluralistically. Pearl, it's, it's so generic, you know. But in that day, it was a name of scorn, mockery. Oh, you're a follower of Christ. You believe that he was the Jewish Messiah. And you believe he did those miracles and rose from the dead. You're a Christian. Oh, that was a scorn name. A name of mockery. You really believe in all that magic? All that hoopla? <laughs> really? Wow. You're a Christian. <laughs> Learned fool. That's really how it was. But you know what? They weren't called the followers of Barnabas. The followers of Paul or Saul. They were called the followers of Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to be a good man, if you'll be one of God's few good men, few good ladies, one of God's few good ladies, you need to be, last of all, showing your Christianity. The world doesn't know, need to know necessarily that you're a member of Catholic Church. Oh, that's a wonderful thing. doesn't need to know how good a job you do, how well stacked your career is, how well stacked your bank account is, how good your you know, pension is, 
what kind of car you drive. The one thing they need to know about you is, are you a Christian? Do you follow Christ? Are you one of those that follow after Christ? You believe in His death, burial, and resurrection. You believe in His power to change your life and change others' lives. That's what God's few good men do. They show their Christianity. Amen. Hey, the church at Jerusalem had the same opportunity. But they weren't called Christians in Jerusalem. It was in Antioch. Because they were following after Christ. They were obeying Christ and sending out the gospel. In conclusion, are you one of God's few good men? Are you like Stephen, willing to be scattered? <clears throat> the word of God might go forth. Are you like the Cyrenians who were sowing God's word and preaching it, proclaiming it with every opportunity that God gave them? Are you like Barnabas and willing to be sent? Are you a good man? A man of integrity? A man of honesty? Are you searching for those who can help in carrying out the gospel like Barnabas did with Saul? Are you willing to be used? When someone comes to you and says, hey, You've got a knack for that. You'd be able to do that. You could, you could help in this ministry. Are you willing to be used? Saul was. Amen. Then last of all, are we showing the world that we're a Christian? Are we an undercover Christian? Are we out and, out and about with it? Are we loud, a loud and proud Christian? Yeah. We say, oh, loud and proud, yeah. We don't, yeah, th th there's, there's a time and place for it. Amen. It wouldn't to be boisterous. It wouldn't be in everybody's face trying to push it down their throat. But will there not be any question? Will there not be any doubt? They're a follower of Christ. They love Jesus. They're a Christian. Amen. Are you one of God's few good men? Let's close the word of prayer.